you look at that piece. You ever seen those things, and I think you guys mentioned the other day, you know, where you, see, you look at something and then, like, what's your name did, and then, like, if you look at the shirt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, if you look at that long enough and look at the shirt, mm -hmm. you know, do you see it? Do you see sure. it come on there? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, see if you could transfer that energy. Am I crazy? No, I can't see it, though. Can you see it? I cannot see it either. All right, bring that down. Bring that camera down right there. Okay. <laughs> Look at that. That's awesome. So this is actually a print of that piece there. So I teamed up with this company, and um, so basically, if you're, we did them as like they could be baptism teams. <laughs> right? That's awesome. And then also you can wear them to work out. So when you sweat or run, like it'll it'll appear when, once it's wet. And then when it's dry, it goes goes away. What's up everybody? Welcome to the Bread Winner Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Harris, and today uh, we've got the pleasure of actually not being in my studio, in my office, and uh, we're here with Jared Emerson. Uh, in his studio here in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, we're gonna bring him on here in just a second uh, to tell you a little bit more about him. Uh, but me and him filmed a round table yesterday uh, here in Greenville with two other guys on being a modern man. And I thought it went freaking incredible. I thought it was gonna be some, it's gonna be some really good content. So you guys make sure that you check out uh, the Daily Bread vlog for that. It's called The Modern uh, Man. But wanted to bring on Jared on this podcast because He's just asking me, what's this podcast all about? Like, is it a business podcast? You know, what's, what's the main theme? And the, the thing with me in this podcast is I just wanna meet interesting people. I wanna hear interesting stories. And what I love the most is meeting people that you instantly know that they're doing what they were born to do. And I almost envy artists, whether it's your type of art or whether it's a musician, whether it's a singer, because it's so apparent, right? Like when you do what you do, it's obvious. When a drummer plays the drums, when the guy plays the saxophone, it's obvious if they're good. <laughs> it's obvious that like, that's what that person was born to do. Uh, and I always kind of struggle with how that translates in the business world. You know, it's hard to find a CEO and you, when you see that CEO, you're like, that particular business that that person is the CEO of is exactly what they were born to do. Uh, but with art, it's so freaking apparent. Um, it's certainly so apparent with you. So I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. Um, but what I want you to do, man, is just tell everybody a little bit about you, kind of where you're from, uh, what, what brought you to this point, and then we'll kind of just unpack some stuff with a few questions and okay. we'll be there. Well, thanks for, thanks for having of me, first of all. And uh, welcome to my studio right down here in Greenville, South Carolina. My name is Jared Emerson, and I paint, finger paint for a living. That's what I do. And I do custom stuff as well, from oils to charcoals to acrylics to mixed media, you name it. Um, but I'm more well known for the, I guess, the speed painting. Yeah. And I've been doing that about 11 years. And um, my journey, and I don't even know where to begin. Like my journey so where is, are you from? is, yeah. I'm originally from Perry, Michigan. Okay. I grew up there. I uh, went to. Uh, a year of Bible college in okay. upstate New York. Growing up, like basketball was my my life. Yeah. Um, I mean, my priorities. When you think of priorities, right? Yeah. yeah. It was basketball, girls, yeah. friends, yeah. family, and then God was thrown in there somewhere. Yeah. And um, so for me, I think my priorities were just totally sure. messed up growing up. And uh, my the end of my first year of, of college playing basketball, I ended up blowing out my knee. And that kind of just changed the path and the thinking yeah. process for me was, man, I, I'm not going to be able to live my dream out. Because mm -hmm. at the time, I went to a small school, no insurance, no. My parents that year moved to China. Oh, wow. So they, their teachers there teach English and, um, and also God's Word. and. Um, I was 19 year old, didn't know what I was going to do with my life, and through my parents and, and some friends, I ended up moving to West Palm Beach, Florida. Okay. And at West Palm, just started my art career, but I was living with a uh, some family friends, 
and just doing portraits here and there. She would introduce me to some people, so I'd paint some yachts for some, you know, guys that own their yacht clubs, sure. and and then I would also uh, do portraits for people. And you know, one lady, I'll tell you what, this was a turning point for me in my life was a lady wrote me a check, a blank check, and she said, "Paint me something," because I didn't really paint much at that time. I just did drawings. And she said, if you can draw like that, like you can paint. Wow. And I was like, what do you want me to paint? And she just <laughs> said, whatever. So it's there in, there uh, near West Palm. I actually was living in Stewart, Florida. And it's right there where Jupiter is, you know, the yeah. lighthouse. Yeah. We talked about the lighthouse yesterday. Yeah. You know, be a light that shines. So I ended up uh, painting a lighthouse and she was gonna give it to her son. So I filled it out. I think I put like 750 bucks, which yeah. for me at that time, 750 sure. bucks was like, wow, I'm, I'm getting this much <laughs> for, for a painting. For something that didn't know she wanted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she could give it back and say, this <laughs> yeah. is terrible. So I ended up doing this uh, um, lighthouse. I gave it to her and, and, and she loved the painting and she looked at me and she said, this is all that you put? And so I was thinking, oh, should I put more, you know? <laughs> But I thought it was fair for what I was doing at sure. that time. You know, I wasn't going to put a crazy amount, and sure. I wasn't going to put it too too small. And uh, for me at the time, and so for me, I think it was a, a changing point of hey, I'm able to put that price on what I do. Absolutely. And through there, my story, man, my story goes on and on. But I ended up having uh, ended up moving with a, in with a couple guys that lived in a one bedroom apartment like three of them and then me. Um, one day on the beach, I finally like stepped forward and my knee finally just gave way, like everything. It was my ACL, MCL, PCL, meniscus. And uh, through a, a friend of mine, Matt McAleese, uh, his father was a chiropractor. Uh, we went and had some x-rays done and then through another friend got, and, and granted, I'm a, I'm a starving artist at yeah. the time, right? I'm just, I'm like a charity case living with people. And I could say for a period of time in my life, like I was homeless, yeah. but God always took care of me and I lived in mansions. Like sure. I lived in some of the most beautiful homes, yeah. um, but they weren't my homes, yeah. you know? And I just knew a lot of people believed in me. So worked at a hotel, was doing like valet and um, just, just kind of hustling. Mm -hmm. And when that injury happened again, it was kind of like the last straw for me. Like, I got to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And through a friend of mine, his name's Caleb, Caleb Clardy, he, uh, his parents lived here in Greenville. And I moved to Greenville, to Pottersville area. And within 30 days, his father was able to get the, the doctor to come to the house, look at my knee, and within 30 days had surgery, went through physical therapy. Um, my doctor was Dr. Bill DeVault. And my physical therapist was Marty Clary. He used to be a pitcher for the Braves. Yeah. And um, just through those, even through those connections, just God just changed my path totally from where I was heading. Yeah. And moved to Greenville. He said, Jared, pack up your car, move up here. So when all that happened, um, I remember my buddy Caleb, his father, was just like he was he owned his own own company. It was a rug company, and he would always just encourage me. Like he was a salesman. Like he would always encourage me. Hey, you can sell anything. You can do anything. You can be anything. And I remember him bringing to me to a, a Friday night football game, high school football game, Greenville High School versus uh, someone else. And he said, "You need to see how football is in the South." I'm like, "All right." So I, I checked that out, and it was amazing just to see how excited people were about this game of football. And we I remember driving down Greenville, you know, this studio and this place wasn't here. They were yeah. just starting to build all this. And I remember pointing down here in this area and saying, man, one day it would be awesome to have a studio. That's awesome. Like have my own studio yeah. and um, you know, see where it goes from there. Part of that story was one day in the middle of the night, this was six months after I moved here, okay? I meet this guy, Mr. Clardy. Okay, he was the guy that was kind of like going to get me to the next level, going to help me out. And I just, I, I cared about the guy a lot, and he, I knew he cared about me because he took me in his home with his family. 
and wanted to help me out. I mean, literally fixed, sure. fixed my leg. And I remember one night waking up in the middle of the night to his wife just screaming and the dog barking. They lived in a pretty big house and I was upstairs. I came running downstairs and in the bathroom he had had a heart attack and wow. fallen down and she was she was trying to revive him. The ambulance was just getting there. Um, so I must have woken up way after he had first fell. Sure. And uh, I was a little scared to death in, in the fact of, I think somewhat selfishly too, like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like what just happened? Yeah. Is he gonna make it? And then also, you know, I mean, they were dear people, dear friends and people sure. to me and just with with Mrs. Carter, what is she gonna do? And anyway, three days later, he ended up. Uh, they pronounced him deceased, uh, just brain dead. And I remember being in the hospital, and I think the rest of the family went home to be together. And I was there, and the nurse finally said, "I think that's that's it." So for me, it was a it was a changing point, another changing point in my life, another turn of, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, and I look back now, you know, I went through some, I told Mrs. Clark, hey, I can move out and whatever. She said, no, you, you stay here. And um, so I lived there for about three years, you know, and then I'm trying to do my own thing and trying to do whatever. And a lot of things I did, I think, were not fair to her because I'd come home late. You sure. know, this is her home. And I just realized all these different things, and you know, for the longest time, I could never take care of myself. And I feel like uh, it came to a point where I could finally take a step out and start take, taking care of myself. Yeah. And I was doing drawings and stuff at their kitchen table, and just doing out and stuff. I ended up meeting my my wife here in Greenville. Now, uh, she was the. Uh, I say she was like a, another turning point for me, just introduced me to a lot of people here in Greenville. Yeah. And, uh, but to back up a little bit, when I would draw at the kitchen table, Mr. Clardy, when he would come home, he'd always come around and look at me and see what I was drawing or working on. Yeah. There's actually a, a picture up there of Marilyn Monroe that I actually wow. painted at their kitchen table. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't paint it, I drew, I drew it. Yeah. And I remember coming and looking at that piece and saying, hey, Jared, you, what are you doing here? You kind of messed that up. Like, you need to fix that a little bit. And I'd look up and I'd be like, what are you talking about, man? Like, and uh, <clears throat> he would always do that, but he'd always say, hey, remember, remember, I'm just critiquing you because I want you to be better. And he said, but remember this, your critics are your critics because they can't do what you do. And I said, hmm. So that's just something that always stuck with me. And I, I've realized the negative, there's always going to be negative feedback, negative talk. Listen, art is very subjective. Not everyone's going to like my work. But some people are. And those are the people I want to be able to make it something that really speaks to them. And uh, that last night, he said that to me. He walked in the kitchen and he turned around and he said, this is Mr. Clardy, and he said, hey, Jared, I love you, man. He said, you have a good night. I'm going to go see Martha and then get to bed. I said, all right. And he had never once said, I loved you like that. Yeah. Like he, it was the first time I heard him say, I love you. And it was the last time I ever talked to him. So, you know, I just, I look now and in this studio that we're in, we're, I mean, we're having this podcast. I believe wholeheartedly that he would be so proud of where I am today and a lot of things I've been able to do through art yeah. and that I never dreamed I'd be a part of. And from that, from that point, I ended up getting a little studio at Poe Mill over here for a little bit. And then when this opened up through, through some artists, I was able to be a part of that. And through the city and the developers, they put art, artists in this, these studios. And so I've been here about 11, I think 11 years since they built River Place. Oh, wow. And that's kind of brought me here. Did he have other kids? Yeah, so he had he had two two children, okay. Andrea and Caleb. Caleb was my friend down in West Palm Beach, and then just a, a lot of connections. Um, he's he started a church in, in I think 
Brooklyn, New York, with mm -hmm. a buddy named Zach Williams. Zach's in a band called The Lone Bellow. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of them. They're an amazing band. And yeah. um, in West Palm Beach, uh, I, I met a guy named Mike D, Mike Donahue, and he's a uh, lead singer of 10th Avenue North, mm -hmm. Christian band. And, yeah. and so to see where we were back then as like young, I mean, they, these guys were in college. I was out of college. Um, but to look back and see where they've all come and, and gone. Yeah. Um, and I'm doing my thing, and, and now I'm married, and I have uh, two stepchildren, and, uh, which I claim is my own. Yeah. Uh, Jessica Matthew, and then I have a little, little boy, he's three years old, named Jordan. And I'm able to take care of my family and provide for them today. So, um, so I, I'm, when I moved here, I started doing some paintings a little bit and, yeah. and drawings for, for people. And then the um, pastor of my church, he actually asked me, hey, you should paint on stage one day. Hmm. And I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> like, like, why would I paint in front of people? Like, that is not my, like, I don't want to embarrass myself. Yeah. I'm not going to paint in front of people. And he said, well, you just think about it, and uh, you know, we'll talk again. So... How about I thought, you know, I, I should try that. There was a guy named Denny Dent. He was, uh, I'd say, the original like speed painter in yeah. the 70s and 80s. Okay. And uh, he kind of paved the way for a lot of guys that do it now. And I like to think that I, I and as well as some other guys, were able to pave the way now for other guys um, to do it. You know, YouTube and everything else, you can go and find all kinds of, yeah. you know, crazy artists that do crazy yeah wow factor type things you know and so I I just wanted to do something that's impactful and uh, I saw him and I thought hey how cool would it be to do this without using brushes you know just just your fingers and so now that's mainly what I do so he had asked you to do that on stage before you were even doing the speed painting correct he was just asking you to do a regular never painting. never did anything I, I did a piece <laughs> for the for the church of like a modern day shepherd yeah and they put it on their 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 bulletins and stuff. That I mean, my church is you know six thousand people, yep. and uh, so it's a little scary when you have to get up yeah. in front of that that crowd for the first time. And uh, part of me getting over my own fears was that moment. So I, I still play ball once in a while, just you know nothing like I used to. Yeah. And uh, the week before, I ended up re tearing uh, I think it was my MCL and so the next week was when I had to do that painting uh, and this piece that's on that shirt is the first time actually that's the painting I yeah. did first like speed fast painting and uh, you know I go up there they had put plastic down like tarp mm -hmm. and the tarp is you know, when you're, you're trying to move around, it's going to move around <laughs> you, right? Yeah. And then you have paint. I'm dipping a brush and my hands and this paint and, uh, you know, that's dripping down and it's on plastic. So I'm sliding. I got a bum leg. <laughs> I get up there. The, 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 uh, it wasn't canvas. It was actually um, fabric on wood. Okay. So I get up there not realizing this fabric, when I put the paint on it, it's going to seep through. <laughs> Like, it's not going to move. And how am I going to do this in, like, seven minutes or whatever it was? And so I get up there, and I start going, and I'm just throwing paint, just trying to figure out my my areas. And, man, my first thought, again, is selfish. Jared, what are you doing? You're going to fall. These people are going to be like, he threw some paint up there, fell down, and walked away. Like, that was pointless. And my, my second thought was, like, just prayer. Like, God, I need your help, yeah. man. Like, like get me through this moment and so I kept going and at the end at the end of the piece it's a depiction it's kind of abstract depiction of Jesus face with the crown of thorns and then at the end I throw this red on there and I think in the cameras on the screens and everything you could see that red hit it yeah. and so when I did that in that moment like you could hear the crowd just kind of like oh, you know that like sigh and you can feel when you're up on stage anyway with music going and everything sure. else you can still he, like people don't realize but you can still hear like whispers and different <laughs> things going on and um, 
So if I ever hear a negative one, then I'm like, oh, I better hurry up and, and bust this thing out and make it look better. Uh, but in that moment, it just gave me, I think, a sense of relief. Like, okay, I'm done. Something's happening. I have no idea. I think the painting's terrible. I put my head down, I touch it, and I walk out. And it's not till I go to the green room and I sit there and I look at the, the monitor and I see he's saying a last prayer and behind him I see the peace. And it just like hits me, you know? And in that moment, I feel like, you know, for me and a man of faith, like the Holy Spirit for me was just saying, Jerry, look, when you are literally broken and, and you're able to be a part of something and um, see how I work, then look at the possibilities and opportunities when you're 100%. So for me, I was like, you know what, you're right, I'm broken physically, but if I was 100%, what are the possibilities? Yeah. And so it was after that moment, um, and I had to do two more services after that, so those <laughs> actually turned out a little better because I was prepared. Yeah. But that's what took me to the next phase of my life and in, in going down the path of performance art, speed painting to where it's not just me up there entertaining someone, it's, it's hopefully moving people in a certain way. And, and now I've been able to do, I mean, I've done halftime shows, I've done um, painting at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, uh, I've been on tour with Winter Jam, yeah. um, I've worked with different musicians from Smokey Robinson to the mm -hmm. Eagles, and I never dreamed that I would be throwing paint on a canvas, yeah. you know. So it's been it's been an amazing journey so far. And uh, I mean, there's so many other things that I've done, and I continue to do and, and build new goals to yeah. keep going. Um, so that's a little bit of my story. That's awesome. You know, there's the ups and downs all the way through it. Absolutely. And uh, what was the what was the first memory you have of creating art? First memory? Yeah, like when you were a little kid, like what did, where did it start for you? Because obviously there was that point where you started diving further into art, but where did that, that would have, I guess, come from uh, some, some history as a child? Well, obviously in kindergarten or in finger painting <laughs> class, right? No, you know what, I, I would say I had a, a teacher when I was in, I forget it, I forget what grade I was in, third grade? fourth grade, fifth grade, because I homeschooled for a little bit, and um, so she tried to teach me the color pa palette, which she did a great job, but I still don't know the whole color palette, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a visual guy, I learn as I go through, through just digging my hands in it, um, and since I didn't go to school for art, I continue to learn, but I remember um, that as one, and then another one, there's a painting that I have still here. It's actually of a lighthouse, uh, one in, uh, I believe it's in Portland. Pretty famous lighthouse, but um, that was my first real painting that I did. I think I was about 15, 16 years old that I tried to make it look real. And uh, I look at it now and pe people have come in here and say, man, this, this is a beautiful painting. But like the proportions are totally wrong. <laughs> And it's a decent painting, but I, I thought if I could find time to do that actual painting yeah. again today, yeah, yeah. what it would look like would be would be pretty pretty neat experience. But um, that's another one, and so that's actually my first painting I probably yeah. ever did. And now I can say I've I've done probably thousands and thousands of work. So I love how you talk about. It. I mean, faith is a huge part of you but it comes out in your work, obviously. Like people will be able to see that watch the video of this. I mean, it's in so much of your work. Um, interesting, I'll, I'll paraphrase quickly because I've mentioned this on the, on the, on the uh, podcast before, but there was this day I was having just, I had had a bad couple of weeks just trying to figure out like really what I was supposed to be doing. I was selling life insurance and I was on the road you know, four days a week, every single week in hotels and away from my family and just trying to figure out like, what is my purpose? Like, what was I legitimately, what was I born to do? Mm -hmm. And I'd left work. My wife was up in Asheville. That's where she's from. And she had gone up there to visit some family and I was heading up there after work. We we're going to meet, we we're growing out with her family. And I sent her a text message as I'm driving up to 
26, I guess. And um, I sent her a message and I said, I said, hey, you want me to grab some beer on the way? Because we're grilling out. And she had had like a rough day with our daughter, I guess. Her daughter had just been nuts that day. And uh, I said, or beer and tequila. And I'm going up through the mountains. You know, you get to those certain areas in the mountains, you just lose service and I'm not even thinking about it. So I put my phone in between, like, like on my thigh, in between my legs, something like that. And I just start praying. And just like that real, like, sobbing, praying, like, I need you to, I need you to show me right now what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I can't figure it out. Like, I'm doing all these different things all over the place, but I don't feel like I'm doing what I was born to do. Like, I need you to tell me right now, right now, what am I supposed to do? And right as I said that, I'm coming over the other side of the mountain, I get service again. My wife texts me, my phone vibrates in my, in my lap. And I look at it, and she said, preach. And I'm like, come again? <laughs> what was that? What? Excuse me, excuse me? But it was such a powerful moment because, I mean, it's, it was like in the heat of that prayer, like, show me right now, phone vibrates, preach. And like, you know, she meant like preach, like, yeah, like, tell me about it. I've had a bad day too. I need some beer and tequila. Right. So looking back at the context, it's kind of funny. But, <laughs> and the fact that people don't use that phrase anymore. But, um, but the interesting thing that I figured out over the next few months and really as I started documenting my life on social media mm -hmm. is that it didn't say be a preacher. It just said preach. Right. And you can preach from any platform, whether it's on stage with your fingers and paint right. or whether it's on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and through a vlog or through a podcast. But you can preach from any platform and it's just about putting that message out. It's, it's interesting you say that because my, my parents, you know, going and being missionaries. Yeah. My, my mom always wanted me to be a preacher. Sure. And I always thought, you know, I'm, I'm not much of a speaker and everything else. And, and so when this came along, it was like I was able to preach without using words, you Absolutely. know, just use my hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, and now I do speak in different, you know, I do these, I do cruises, um, all, all these different cruises where I'm able to, one's a K-Love cruise. I've done a cruise with the Property Brothers, with yeah. the Doug Dynasty yeah. guys. <laughs> Um, so I'm painting all, all these different things, <clears throat> but uh, um, even did a, I've even done a couple of TED Talks, which is, awesome. which is fun, and uh, you know, you guys can check them out. It might yeah. be a little corny, but sure. there's one I'm doing this lion and talking about being bold, hmm. and um, but I think it's interesting how God can change your path, right? Change yeah. your, because I knew if I followed the path of being a preacher. Uh, that's not what I knew yeah. I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. And I knew I was supposed to be creating mm -hmm. um, because I believe he created us to create and that's that can be anything, right? Yeah. You know, like with what you're doing in social media and everything, yeah. you're creating dialogue, yeah. you're creating um, people to really open up their minds, expand and think, yeah. right? That's that lighthouse, being a lighthouse. Right. Really and good. so, uh, yeah, I think the world comes in a full circle and I think we're all called to just do our part. One of the, one of the biggest things, you ever heard of the book The Shack? The Shack is a, uh, it's a book, I think, I think it came out 2005, but uh, Paul Young is the author and he wrote it to his children. It's, I think it sold well over, thir uh, was it 28 million copies? Wow. And the book of the shack, you've heard of the movie. Yeah. So there's a so, movie, The so Shack. So that's based off this book. Okay. And it's basically just that shack is a place where we go to as individuals to confront God, right? To say, hey, all the hurt and wrong that's happened in my life. Because I know probably in your life, my life, and people out there, I mean, some people have been through some rough times oh, yeah. and some traumatic, horrible, horrific things. And... Um, that shack is that place you can go and confront that, right? I mean, this is a man that was abused sexually, um, physically, um, taken advantage from men most of his life, and uh, um, he wrote this book to just tell his children about his past, but also who he was and yeah. his... So, although it's a fiction Christian book, it's all truth, because it's him giving characteristics to who God is, right? Sure. And in the in in the movie in the book, God is is this big black woman that's cooking and whistling and joyful and full of love that's just wanting to love people through food, right? Yeah. And nourishment. 
and um, the Holy Spirit is this Asian wisp, right? And then Jesus is this Middle Eastern. Go figure, right? Jesus is Middle Eastern. Um, <laughs> but that he's just building things and, and, and huh. is just happy and joyful. So if you haven't seen the movie or, or read the book, it is amazing. But in, in meeting Paul, I met Paul on a cruise ship. Yeah. On, on this cruise ship, he was an author that was speaking. You know, as an artist, I'm thinking, you know, most book people, they're creative, but not much personality. Sure. I'm not going to, you know, I want to meet these other artists. <laughs> like, I want to see Toby Mac and all yeah. these other musicians. And uh, on, the, on the cruise ship, I met him. He hugged me. We talked. Like, this is a turning point for me in how I, how I view my life and my purpose. And I don't, at the moment, I didn't know what that meant because I didn't know who Papa was. I was yeah. like, was that your dad, your grandfather, what, you know what? And I uncontrollably just started crying, like, wow. like almost wailing in a yeah. sense. And, and here I am on a cruise and I'm, <laughs> I'm supposed to be one of the entertainers wow. and there's people around and I'm like, I'm just crying. I'm like, man, everyone's going to think I just got like, <laughs> just found Jesus, right? Um, and he was just like, he was patting my heart and he was saying, Jared, just, just let it go. It's okay, let it go. Mm. And I couldn't really stop crying. I kept doing it. And I went back to my cabin and my wife was like, I'm like, babe, I'm sorry. I don't know what, I don't know what's wrong with me. And she's like, she's like, she's like are you well, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And, and I said, babe, I, I don't know what's wrong. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm still crying. And she's like, well, what did he say to you? And so I told her, he said, I went and visited Papa and your picture was on his refrigerator. And she said, well, you know who God, who Papa is, right? And I said, well, not really. And she said, well, in the book, Papa's God. And I'm like, it just clicked for me. Like, he was just encouraging me in what I do mm -hmm. to participate in this world and to keep painting, not because, hey, I'm just painting, yeah. but to make a difference. And when you think of going to someone's home and when you like when I go to your refrigerator you yeah. probably have a picture of your your, your kid yeah. right maybe a drawing that that she did or whatever yeah. right and it, it just made me think that I he was encouraging me saying you're as a child of God just participate in this world and here's another analogy I don't know how we are in time but he said Jared picture yourself like you're on the beach and you're running like you're going for a jog and as you're running in the distance, you see someone just, you, you can see they're, they're playing in the sand. And as you get closer, you realize that they're, they're kind of looking up and like motioning. And as you get even closer, you realize that they're, you know, you're looking like who they want to come over and that you realize it's you. And as you get a little closer, you realize that motion is coming from a, a dude that looks like Jesus, you know, whatever Jesus might look like. And as you get closer, he's just calling you to come build castles and play in the sand. Mm -hmm. So he said, Jared, so in this world, don't use that word use. Like no one wants to be a tool, right? Yeah. People want to participate and be a part of something. And he said, allow yourself to participate in this world. And so I've changed my, my words from use to participate. So why are you doing this? Well, I feel like God wants me to participate in this world. You know, people come in the studio, and I meet people from all walks of life. Yeah. And they see Jesus, a painting of Jesus. They see LeBron. They see a, maybe a Trump or a Ali or whatever. Art's very subjective, right? So people are going to have their own pers perspective and yeah. perception of who I am as an artist based on what they see. And when, the, when you come in here, you realize, I do a little bit of everything. I'm a crazy artist. I do a lot of weird, <laughs> fun, exciting stuff. But um, until you really speak to me and know who I am, because everyone, everyone wants to prejudge, right? Everyone's yeah, going to prejudge you. I mean, most people, I used to have really long hair, and people just thought I was this long hair, pot-smoking artist that just carefree and whatever. That's really not me, though. I'm... I'm I'm just a dude that wants to create art f for people to enjoy and um, take that on to either someone else. Because 
it doesn't make sense for me to create art and no one see it. Yeah. Right? Everyone needs to see it, whether they like it or not. Yeah. You know, someone will, and then they'll pass it on. Um, that piece up there of the hand with the nail in it. Yeah. I had a guy in China because I painted in China back in 2012, and he was talking about this painting, and they moved from place to place, and he was naming the different places in China, um, in Asia that he's been and that that painting's traveled to. And he said, when people see it, just the conversation it brings up. Absolutely. You know, what is that? What is that nail there? And he's just able to share with them what the, what, what that means to him, hmm. you know? And I think it's beautiful. So I, I share that story with you about Paul because he's a, he's a wonderful man. We're that really, was the first time you'd ever met him. First time I'd ever met him, he had That's said those things to me. Thing. Yeah, and we have we've talked about it, and and he thought some of the things I was telling him about myself. He just thought it was ludicrous. Like, like you're not a tool, bro. Like you're yeah. you're you're a real individual. You're a person, and you have a purpose in your life. And and I'm not telling you what your purpose is. You're gonna figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and we've stayed in contact, and he's he's the type of guy you meet. He won't shake your hand. He he'll only hug you, and. Um, one thing he told me is with that word use is is someone that doesn't know God doesn't want to be used by God they don't know. Especially if they're a person that's had heartache through their, throughout their entire life. Yeah. They want a God that they know loves them. You know? So when you when you say, listen, God loves you and I'm just participating in this world for him, then it, it changes things. I think it changes the, the narrative, right? It's a, comp it's a completely completely different frame of reference right. that's interesting I've never I've never looked at it that way use versus participate a lot of people a lot of people have recently heard say how you show up in the world like how you show up in the world right. that's interesting with being used the question I was just about to ask you you just answered it which is what's one misconception people have that you want to set straight but you talked about those immediate misconceptions that we all have uh, but what's one thing over the last few years, um, as you've kind of figured out that, hey, this is, this is my deal, this is what I was born to do, I'm going to go on stages and I'm going to make an impact, I'm going to have my art um, be a source of inspiration for people um, and entertainment and all that, during that period of time, and that's been how many years now of, of performing? Performing about 11 years. Okay. Yeah. So during that period of time, what's one thing that you quit doing? that you feel enabled you to succeed or to grow faster during that period of time? I quit, well the number one thing is I quit being lazy, right? That's a good one. I think most artists are lazy. Yeah. I mean, I was, sure. I was lazy. Sure. Um, and sometimes, I wouldn't say it's lazy, but sometimes you need to, when you push yourself to the limits, you do need to relax sure. and take some time to yourself and, and um, make sure you don't push yourself too hard to where you, you, you get sick and everything else. I mean, I get colds and this stuff here and there, but if I, if I stress myself out too much, it's not going to work. Um, and that's another thing is stress. Yeah. Stress for me has always been um, something that I think maybe controlled me, mm -hmm. and I had to learn to kind of let go. You can say let go, let God. You've heard that. Sure. Um, but let go of the stress in your life because it's not going to help you, it's going to harm so you. So what does that look like for you? What, what was that tangibly? Um, I, think it's, I think it's with, uh, with performing. Yes, I, I still get nervous and I get a little anxious, like anxiety, yeah. because that's me still loving what I do. So yeah. when I go up on stage, whether it's 30,000, 50,000, or whether it's 50 people, I'm still prepared in my craft but I don't stress over it. I don't stress over all the craziness. And my manager and people that helped me over the years, one of my good friends, Carl Brewster, you call him Carl with a K, he's, he would be like, man, you're just stressing out. <laughs> and, but it's because I want all the elements to be right. Yeah. And when you paint outside, like you can't control the elements. Yeah. I mean, I've painted on cruise ships where it's- with minutes. Yeah, it's minutes and rain, wind, all that kind of stuff. Jeez. So inside's a little, little easier to deal with. <laughs> yeah. But for me, I think it was stress over life, right? Stress over uh, finances, stress over, yeah. um, I mean, for a period of time, it was what, I'm, what, what am I gonna eat and where am I gonna eat the next day? Sure. And what do I have to keep me going the next week? 
now I've realized, I mean, I still stress over, you know, maybe some things here and there, but I don't let it overtake me anymore um, because there's no, there's no reason to stress over yeah. stuff you can't control, right? And I think a lot of us as individuals, we stress over things that we can't control. Yeah, we, we can only control ourselves, right? I can only control what I do. So when I say laziness and, st and, and stress, is I was probably stressed because I was lazy, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. And like I said uh, yesterday, in the words of Macklemore, the greats were great because they paint a lot. It's because they worked hard at their craft and what they do. And for me, I realize I have to work hard. There's times where I, I get up and I don't feel like painting, sure. but I know I have to do something yep. for my, to better my craft. It seems like artists in general, it's not, a, it's not a structured environment typically. Right. And most people need structure in their day or structure in their, at least in their week, uh, to be able to maximize their, mm -hmm. their output. Uh, but when it's when there's not strict deadlines, like I love deadlines because it forces <laughs> it forces structure. Same here. Um, anytime that I don't have one, it's like you're trying to put one on it, just in your in your own mind, um, right. to create that efficiency that you need to get it done and get on to the next thing. But there's, so oftentimes I see artists that when there's not when they don't have that in place, it's like, well, I could do it today. Right. I could not do it today. Right, and I and I'm still that way sure. in certain aspects. Yeah. I mean, you've seen how many unfinished yeah, yeah. pieces are going on in here. It's because I get on something and I'm feeling it and I do it, but then I get busy with you know my traveling and everything else. So um, I'm trying to come back to that, and you can't. Sometimes you can't just get back to that. Your mind's got to be in the right place. And for me to get my mind right, like I mean, I might leave in the middle of the day and go watch a movie by myself. Yeah. I might just blare different music to inspire me or find a song that's going to really inspire me. Some static dancing in here. Yeah, yeah. You, listen, if you walk by my studio, my studio is <laughs> glass down here in Greenville, South Carolina. Sometimes at night, if my wife lets me you know, do some stuff at night, you might walk by and there might be a blank canvas that I am just, I'm in front of just, that's it's awesome. like I'm creating something but I'm doing it in the air. That's gotta be and you might be Instagram like, live worthy. yeah, right? For sure. That guy is crazy. We should do that sometime where I'm just, I'm in my world just focusing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I do need some, I might need some help on my, my dance moves. <laughs> He's got you. TJ's got you. I don't, I, I can't. Because when I'm, when I'm on that stage, I, I do always have a nice little bump and, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm shaking a little bit. But you know, that's, that's, that's the beauty too of, of what I do is like, you might get up in front of a huge crowd. Yeah. But once I'm in front of that canvas, like, it is on between me and that canvas, yeah. right? It is, it's like nothing else exists and I'm in my moment and I'm just creating and I let my mind and my emotion kind of take over. And that's what I love about that feeling. And there's still a lot of adrenaline. Oh yeah. Do you feel that dump after? Like do you feel that? that? Yeah, you feel like there's something that's just relieved you of, yeah. of, of, of something. Of course, I'm usually sweating like crazy afterwards because it's, um, yeah, it is literally, it is literally right now my only workout I get throughout the Yeah, day. I mean, it's literally like you're, it's almost, because you're kind of on your toes, it's almost like jumping rope right. for eight straight minutes while also having to stay incredibly focused and concentrated. And I still cannot figure out how in the world some of the stuff gets done upside down. Yeah. But those are the most incredible moments. It's like, it's like, you need, to, you need I don't know if you, and you probably have this, but there's, I feel like there's some specific music that would just amp up the freaking that moment when you when it just becomes the image it's almost like that waiting for the beat to drop and it's right. just like that uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it's like you're getting closer and closer yeah. and closer and then all of a sudden you just flip it and people go freaking you nuts know, and that's the i think that's the key a lot of times when you perform is the yeah. music yeah. um oh, yeah. and from what you just explained i, I want to do something like that yeah. i have a, a guy that we're working on like a, a introduction like an introduction promo oh, yeah. Um, yeah. beat, right? For sure. And then it goes into whatever I'm doing. So usually the music, I try to relate it to whatever I'm painting. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes it might end soft and sometimes it might, it depends on the mood you're trying to give to people. And then sometimes it ends with a big bang with me just jumping and smacking a thing mm -hmm. and um, letting people know it's, it's over. So, question for you. Yeah. A guy like me, business guy, sales guy, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I think everyone needs a creative outlet, right? right? 
think you would agree with that. Without a doubt. What does that look like for the person that's listening to this that considers themselves not particularly creative, considers themselves not tip particularly skilled in any area of the things that you would consider creative, music, art, um, what would you tell that person to, ha to bring a little creativity into their life and what it could potentially do for them? to kind of add that into some type of, maybe it's a weekly routine, maybe it's a monthly routine. It's not every day they're, they're getting out and going crazy on a canvas. I, I honestly think it, it has to do with what, what makes you feel good, right? Yeah. And I don't mean like drugs or drinking or whatever. Sure. I, I mean like just what makes you happy doing something, right? If you enjoy doodling, doodle. Yeah. If you enjoy singing in the shower, like sing in the shower or sing in, in open air. If you if you need to relieve something in you that just, I mean, you just have to yell, yell. Um, I think art, painting, drawing is very uh, um, therapeutic, right? Um, it can relieve some stress that you may have. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's probably opposite for me than most people. <clears throat> But I think, because sometimes I have, I have to get something done, sure. whether I'm in the moment or not, yeah. I have to push myself to get in that <laughs> yeah. moment. Um, but I think it's just, it's finding something that makes you happy, right? Um, in a moment and do it. Yeah. Um, and, to, and to just be able to like check out. Yeah. To me, like I play the piano. And so for me, like that's one of the only times where I'm able to turn a portion of my brain off that's just nonstop, won't, won't stop, and just completely check out and just play and just not think about anything other than just whatever I hear. Because right, you're uh, lost in those notes, Yeah, right? completely. And, and yeah. that's like my ultimate form of uh, relaxation, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just figuring out what that is for somebody. Because for, people, need, people need, whether it's meditation, I mean, a meditation is something that I've, uh, that I've started doing lately and has, has been a huge, has made a huge impact on my life. Uh, but just that ability to just check out, like that ability just to um, intentionally take time where you're not plugged in, where you're not staring at your phone, where you're not surrounded by this, this sensory overload that we yeah. live in. You know, it just seems so important to me. Well, to me, music is, is a big, yeah. big thing. And I think music inspires, it inspires me. But I think music inspires people, and it can inspire you in different ways based on what music you listen to. I think you listen to positive stuff, uplifting stuff. Um, there's some crazy music out there that just, you know, maybe puts you in a mood of, oh, yeah. you know. But then there's also music that puts you in a mood of, yeah, like I can, like I can conquer the the world, right? What's the Rocky song? Yeah. You know, like the, the um, Eye of the Tiger, right? Yeah. Like you can. You hear that and it makes you want to go conquer the world, right? Yeah. When I get in a slump of not being very creative, that's what I do. Yeah. It, music is an outlet yeah. for me to be like, okay, I need something that's going to motivate me and push me. Um, and that is something like that. Yeah. And then again, and that might be a moment where you walk by and you see me acting a mm -hmm. fool in here is because <laughs> I'm in my own little element. But I think to people that don't consider this, themselves creative, I think God created us all as creative beings and there's something in there for you. And that might be if you enjoy singing, dancing, um, you know, working out, running, uh, whatever it is, you know, do those things to get you in, 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 yeah. in more of a, a creative mood. So there's a couple things I want to do as we close. Number one, I want people to follow you on Instagram and Facebook. So where can they find you? Um, on Instagram, it's the Jared Collection, and uh, just at the Jared Collection. Okay. And uh, my website's jaredemerson.com. Facebook, it's you can find me Jared Emerson, okay. um, and then I have a page Jared Emerson Art Reaches Everyone. Okay. That's like my business theme is that okay. art does reach everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm still learning social media. Yeah. I've a couple followers here and there, but. Um, with what I've been able to do and accomplish over the years, um, I feel I have a, a, a good following. Just social media, I think there's a lot of people who don't know how to find sure. the, the right outlet. Um, 
But yeah, Instagram, I usually probably post and do most of my stuff because yeah. it's more visual and what I do is visual. So, yeah, and, and, people, and people that are watching this and people that are listening to this, it's impossible to describe unless you go to his Instagram and you watch one of these videos and you watch him up there on stage in five minutes creating this or watch or just see some of the art that he's created. Um, like for example, so what's, what's this one right here? So this is a, actually a charcoal piece I did of Muhammad Ali. You do a lot of charcoal? So uh, some, I do. Yeah. I mean, I do just about everything. I mean, there's a, a oil painting of a little boy over here yeah. that I'm doing. It's a full on, like, you know, kind of old school portrait. Um, and then this one is charcoal on canvas. So, you know, it's a little porous. Yeah. Um, but I, I saw this picture of Ali and I thought, it's just so cool because it's kind of soft and blurry and then it just focuses on his fist. Yeah. And when you think of Ali, you think of fly like a butterfly, mm -hmm. sting like a bee, right? Yeah. And to me, it was, I wanted to show the sting in his fist. And so that's why, if you can see that in there, you can It's like the sting that. of his fist and then the yeah. reaction once you're laying on the ground, yeah. basically. Right. So the, the thrill in Manila right there yeah. and, and what it's doing to you as you, you're looking at that. But now, the majority um, of your uh, pieces that you're doing right now, are they like commissioned projects? or there's stuff that you just paint like this it sounds like you just painted that with the intention to sell to whoever liked it versus yeah. someone said hey paint me this picture right. so if i get if i get some free time or if i just get an idea and i get a little time to work on something i will yeah. and if i sell it i sell it if yeah. i don't no big thing yeah. but majority of my 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 stuff is probably probably 85 to 90 percent of what i do is traveling and, yeah. and performance with the speed painting and then the other is custom for people. So if someone wants a yeah. painting, a drawing, whether it's hyper-realism, realism, abstract, yeah. uh, so impressionistic, what is, you what name it. Like that cost? So this one here, I believe I have 7,500 on okay. this piece. Okay. Um, my performance awesome. pieces that are within five, 10 minutes, they've gone anywhere from a couple thousand to a hundred thousand. Wow. It just depends on where you are, what you're yeah. doing and, and yeah. who wants it. And what, a lot of times, what cause? Because yep. um, I'm I'm not sure the exact number, but we've we've been able to raise over a couple million dollars just in charities yeah. um, over the years, awesome. and uh, I'm sure it's probably a lot more than that now. Um, we do weddings. I do weddings yeah, as well. So yeah. So cool. I've so the craziest thing is I've done weddings. I've done funerals, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but like sometimes that. people do a celebration of someone's awesome. life, I love that. Um, and then sometimes I've done them at the funeral where it's just something meaningful, um, either of the couple or the deceased. And um, wow. then I've done parties. I've painted in the backyard for with people's kids. Like um, I've also gone to some homes. Like there's the family effect here locally. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved with them. I love family. Effect. I actually went over there with some some young kids, yeah. and I. I figured out a way to do an Albert Einstein painting, <laughs> but I had all the kids dip their hands in paint, and I would awesome. direct them where to hit the That's canvas, awesome. and we created a Einstein piece just out of their handprint. That's awesome. I love the family faith. They're doing incredible stuff yeah. up there, and Dabo mm -hmm. doing so much over there. It's yeah, awesome. Be familiar with uh, Ruben Rojas. He um, founded uh, Beautify Earth. He does the big murals. They typically always say love. Mm -hmm. These big murals. He's out of L.A. Um, you should look him up. He's, he's done, we, hit, we had him on the podcast. He's done some incredible, incredible work. But we were supposed to, we were um, planning to be out in LA when he had this um, huge wall mural they were doing right on Wilshire. And um, they were having a bunch of kids come out to help. And I was like, oh, are the kids gonna actually be painting? And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right, cool. Then I can actually help. <laughs> I'm probably about the same skill level. Uh, but they had to move. They had to move the. Uh, they moved the dates. So we didn't get to do it with him. Um, but the stuff he's doing with Beautify Earth. I mean, it's crazy. You see these awesome. these huge walls, and they go in and put these inc just beautiful murals on it. It's interesting. You know, I love I love murals. I've I've done like maybe one. Yeah. I don't I don't do a lot of murals. Um, I see a lot of artists, you know, from LA to mm -hmm. to New York that yeah. do some crazy stuff. Um, that's one thing I want to do with the city. They've they've asked me to come up with some yeah, concepts. Yeah. So if anyone has any ideas for the city of Greenville, yeah. um, shoot them my way. I'm 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 trying to think of a concept for some even under the bridge here. Yep. It would be just so cool to have some cool art. And since I live here, I think it would be. I mean, 
something I would love to do yeah, for my city, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, it's either, you know, dress in black and go do it in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or go yeah. through the proper channels and make it, <laughs> make it work. I don't want to get locked up in my own city, but, um, you know, I, I love seeing murals all over the place. Yeah. But, yeah, so there's, I have some pieces in here I do prints of yeah. and, and some I don't, and then some that are for sale and um, some that aren't, so. So let's leave people with one last little nugget. And what I'd love to do is just tell kind of briefly one of the coolest moments that you've had, whether it was a person that you met, you did a performance with, whether it was a letter or a message you got from someone that, you know, one of your pieces just moved them or whether it was a halftime show or what's one of the coolest moments that you can think back to? Man, there's so many that, now. I know there's so many. I, um, yeah, now that you put me on the spot, because yeah. you think of there's so many different things oh, yeah. and, and stuff. Um, we got Steelers stuff, we got. Yeah, there's. So many. I, let me give you two, two quick sure. ones. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot of amazing things with amazing people I've met. One of them was, you know, I grew up playing basketball, wanted to be the. You know, wanted to play at the Palace of Auburn Hills, right? Yeah. And um, so instead of my dream coming true as playing basketball at the Palace, I was able to perform at the halftime show with B.O.B. You know, B.O.B. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. And so it was about a four-minute painting that I had to do, and so I actually created him. And afterwards when he was done performing, he turned around, because they said his name and my name. I think they screwed up my name, the announcer <laughs> did. And he turned back, pointed at me, I pointed at him. And he actually, I think, actually saw it for the first oh, time, okay. right? Wow. And he was just like, so backstage awesome. later, he came out and we talked for a minute, but he was like, man, that is dope. Like, you got my good side, man. Um, but but being able to do that and, and not playing basketball but painting yeah. at the Palace of Auburn Hills for yeah. me was great. And now I mean now the palace isn't going to be there anymore yeah. since they moved to Little Caesars Arena. Mm -hmm. um, and another moment for me was I painted Tom uh, Izzo, head coach for Michigan State basketball, which I wanted to play for him one day, but that didn't work out. I actually painted him here in Greenville, and just before I was about to paint. And this is this is a few years back, right? Yeah. So this is still in the beginning stages. Sure. He uh, looked over, gave me a thumbs up, <laughs> and I gave him a head nod, thumbs up. And to me, right? And I've met like from Tim Tebow sure. to to uh, Jerry Rice was probably one of the first athletes I did. I'm um, just Green. Mean Joe Green. I'm um, just some great great athletes. George Hincapie here. He's a close yeah. close bud of mine. Um, all these different things, but Tom Izzo, just that Michigan State, that bleed green down inside, yeah, yeah. was one of those moments where if you like have a dream and it goes in slow motion yeah. and you see it, was him and I thumbing like heads heads up, <laughs> was to me pretty That's pretty awesome. amazing thing. Um, let me share this other one. I know I keep going long, oh, yeah. but um, so just did a uh, cruise with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay. It's called the Legends Cruise. So you have like Mean Joe Green and some of these other. Uh, legends from like Rocky Blyer mm -hmm. and um, and then you have some current guys like uh, Rosie Nix you have uh, Juju Smith Schuster so I did a live painting of Juju upside down wow. right and at the very end at the very end um, I, I just gave him a props and I said, y'all give it up for Juju Smith Schuster. <laughs> and I didn't know that he, he they were going to introduce him to come up. But then he was like, yeah, so he comes running up. He comes running up. And it's actually on my Instagram highlight. You can nice. see him. But he's like, man, I want, because he came up to sign the painting yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. So he came running up and he's going to sign it. And this just happened like a few months ago. But he comes up and he's like, man, I want to use the paint. I want to use my finger like you painted it. And so he gets up there and he's writing, he's writing Juju. You want me to keep going? Yeah. He's writing um, Juju Smith Schuster on the back with his finger. So he starts with Ju <laughs> and he's realizing it's not like you have to. Uh -huh. 
And he, plus, he's got a long name, so he's on there saying, uh, <laughs> man, and, I, and I'm like, Juju's not as easy as it looks, right? <laughs> yeah. So he writes his whole name across the back, and then at the very end, he, he dips his hand in the paint and just smacks it like I usually do at the end. And then he turns around, and he flings the paint into the crowd, <laughs> right? See, my thought is, like, that's so awesome. But then I realized the cruise ship and everything's like, did he just throw paint in the crowd? Like, you know how many people freak out over oh, paint, yeah, right? Yeah. And um, luckily it hit most of the people and not the seats yeah. and stuff. And so they're crazy Steeler fans. Sure. So they're like, Juju got paint on me. This is awesome. Never, never paid in the game. Right. So that was a moment that I, I mean, it happened more recent, so I remember. But just awesome. no one's ever dipped their hand in the paint and just flung it in a crowd before. I don't think I've ever even done that. Um, actually, I did it for uh, a party in Atlanta. It was uh, New Year's Eve, and then they, it was like going into this nice, great little party, and then all of a sudden it turned into like a rave, <laughs> and I was finishing up the painting, and so it was like kids were dancing around, and I'm just throwing paint all over. It's like, it's like the, uh, you're like the arts version of Gallagher. Right, right. <laughs> you start smashing some, some paint balloons. and Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, that's the beauty of art, right? Like yeah. I used to, you know, I'm a realist at heart. So I used to think, man, it's gotta be right. It's gotta be perfect. Yeah. And then as I grew, I just realized, you know, art people want to see the process Seriously. of it. They want to see the mess up, the marks, the handprints. They want to see the splash and the, yeah. you know, the the process of how you got to where you got. So um, hope maybe I'll start putting some more videos on, on Instagram. I used to not so much because I, I and I still believe this too but people need to see it in, in person yeah, yeah. like seeing someone paint live is a whole different experience than watching a you know a video online or edited video or what what not you know it's it's an experience it's true. so well very good man well I've enjoyed this enjoyed Same this here. conversation glad to get to know you you as well Thanks and for uh yeah man so guys this is the breadwinner podcast make sure do me this favor make sure that you go to the jared collection right on on instagram, on instagram the at the jared collection make sure you give them a follow because there's going to be more content coming out on there that you are going to want to see mm -hmm. uh, i promise you but the stuff that's already on there you can spend hours checking all that stuff out and hey if you're a Muhammad Ali fan, this guy's available right here. Yeah, tell tell him, tell him I sent you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, but with that, guys, this is the Breadwinner Podcast, and we will see you next time.